Section 78 of American State Trials, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. American State Trials, Volume 1, by John D. Lawson. Trials of the Quakers, William Robinson, Marmaduke Stevenson, Dyer, and others. Massachusetts, 1659. The Narrative and Trial. Footnote. Bibliography. The legal proceedings against the Quakers by the colonists of Massachusetts Bay were quite informal, and the original documents which have been preserved are few and incomplete. It is impossible, therefore, to give anything more than a general statement respecting these trials. The following account of them is derived from the records of the general court. The papers relating to the subject in the archives of the Commonwealth and the histories of the period referred to. Of the latter, Bishop's New England Judged is a Quaker authority of great weight. It was written in answer to a declaration of the general court made in 1659 in defense of their proceedings. The first part of it was printed in 1661 the second part in 1667, and both united were reprinted with some abbreviation in 1703. It is a rare book, and I am indebted for a copy of it to the proprietors of the Library of Friends in Lynn. Among other works which have been examined are Sewell's History of the Quakers, London 2nd Edition, 1725. Bess's Voluminous Collection of the Sufferings of the Quakers, London, 1753. Cotton Mather's Magnalia. Hutchinson's, Hubbard's, and Neal's Histories. Chandler's Criminal Trials, 33. See Ante, page 116. And a footnote. Little has been preserved of the legal proceedings against the Quakers by the colonists of Massachusetts Bay, but a Massachusetts lawyer who had access to much of the original documents in existence and to the early histories of the period, has given a vivid picture of the trials. The colonists of Massachusetts Bay had no idea of religious toleration. It was preached against as a sin in rulers, which would bring down the judgments of heaven upon the land. They were, in fact, a corporation, existing by virtue of a charter, and possessed a supreme authority for the purpose of carrying into effect the objects of the grant. Surrounded by new and untried difficulties, and far removed from the restraining influences of the common law of England, they assumed an authority inconsistent with its principles, and the general court extended its jurisdiction to the thoughts as well as the conduct of all within the reach of its power. The government was founded on certain religious doctrines, a denial of which was an offense against the state of the nature of treason that a part of their number had a right to change their views of religious doctrine or civil government, never entered into the apprehension of the majority. When in July 1656, two Quakers, Anne Austin and Mary Fisher, arrived in the road against Boston, in a vessel from Barbados, their trunks were searched and their books burnt by the hangman. Other indignities they suffered, for which there was no authority by law, and, after five weeks of close imprisonment, they were thrust out of the jurisdiction, the jailer retaining their beds for his fees. Eight other Quakers arriving in the colony were immediately imprisoned, and sentence of banishment was passed against them all by the court of assistance, the master of the ship in which they came being required to take them away. At this time, there was no law, whatever respecting Quakers. In the following October, a law was made by the general court, which recited that whereas there is an accursed sect of heretics lately risen up in the world, which are commonly called Quakers, who take upon them to be immediately sent of God, and infallibly assisted by the Spirit, to speak and write blasphemous opinions, despising government and the order of God in church and commonwealth, speaking evil of dignities, reproaching, reviling magistrates and ministers, and provided that any master of a ship bringing any known Quaker within the jurisdiction 
should forfeit one hundred pounds, and should give security to carry such Quakers back to the place whence he brought them, and on the arrival of such Quakers, they were to be severely whipped and confined to hard labor in the house of correction. By a subsequent law, persons who should entertain Quakers were liable to a fine of forty shillings for every hour's entertainment. Any person defending their pernicious ways or attending their meetings was also liable to a fine. Every Quaker, after the first conviction, if a man was to lose one ear, and the second time the other, if a woman, she was each time to be severely whipped and for the third offense, both men and women were to have the tongues bored through with a red-hot iron. Nearly all of these punishments were inflicted upon Quakers at different times, but with a directly opposite result from that intended. They construed these severities into an invitation for their presence, and their numbers increased in proportion to the excitement against them. They gloried in their sufferings. They were anxious for martyrdom. Imprisoned, flogged, mutilated, threatened with punishment yet more severe, they were thrust out of the colony but returned in the first vessels they could obtain. They proclaimed their doctrines with a bold and fearless confidence that astonished the people, and they suffered the indignities and cruel punishments inflicted upon them with such mildness, forbearance, and fortitude as convinced many of the reality of that inner light by which they professed to be constantly guarded. At the same time, in partial history records, that many of the sect which, at this day, is remarkable for a guarded composure of language and elaborate stillness, precision, and propriety of demeanor, were at the time referred to guilty of conduct, which the experience of a rational and calculating age finds it difficult to conceive. They openly denounced the government of New England as treason. They reviled at all orders of magistrates in every civil institution. They stigmatized a regular priesthood as a priesthood of Baal. Some of them, in the apprehension of the colonists, were guilty of the most revolting blasphemy against the sacraments, which they termed carnal and idolatrous observances. They interrupted public worship in a manner as indecent as it was illegal and unbecoming. The female preachers exceeded the male in these acts of frenzy and folly and excited the utmost disgust among a people remarkable for their staid and sober deportment. The colonists, incensed beyond measure at this conduct, and alarmed at the swarms of Quakers who were intruding upon them, threatened them with new punishments, the intolerable severity of which defeated their own objects. The government of Rhode Island, more wise than that of Massachusetts, through having the same horror of this sect, declined to pass laws against it. For we find, they said in a letter to the general court, that in those places where these people aforesaid in this colony are most of all suffered to declare themselves freely and are only opposed by arguments and discourse. There they least of all desire to come, and we are informed that they begin to loathe this place, for that they are not opposed by the civil authority, but with all patience and meekness are suffered to say over their pretended revelations and admonitions, nor are they like or able to gain many here to their way. And surely we find that they delight to be persecuted by civil powers, and when they are so, they are like to gain more adherence by the consent of their patient sufferings than by consent to their pernicious sayings. In October 1658, a law was introduced into the Massachusetts General Court, providing that every person of the cursed sect of Quakers who should be found within the jurisdiction should be immediately imprisoned without bail until the next court of assistance, at which they should have a legal trial, and, being convicted to be of the sect of Quakers, should be banished on pain of death. The law met with great opposition and was at first rejected, but, Upon a reconsideration, it was passed by a majority of one vote, with an amendment that the trial should be by a special jury. It met with strong disapprobation of sensible men in Massachusetts and in the other colonies, 
Two members of the court entered their dissent against it, and one other who was detained at home by sickness would have voted against it, and thus have prevented its passage. The younger Winthrop, governor of Connecticut, expressed much disapprobation at such an extreme proceeding, and made great exertions to prevent the law from being carried into effect. There was no lack of victims. Three persons were found within the jurisdiction who had notoriously violated the law, and they were immediately imprisoned. Of these, Mary Dyer, in antimony in exile, had twenty years before left the colony with Anne Hutchinson. Marmaduke Stevenson, previous to his banishment, had made a disturbance in Boston. He acknowledged himself to be a Quaker, and declared that in the year 1656 at Shipton, in Yorkshire, as he was at the plow, he heard an audible voice ordaining him to be a prophet to the nations. William Robinson was from London. At his first examination, he was sentenced to be whipped twenty stripes for abusing the court. These three having been banished on pain of death by the court of assistance, Mary Dyer was claimed by her husband and taken back to Rhode Island. The other two, having come within the colony for the purpose of offering up their lives, determined not to depart. So they went to Salem, and some place they were about to visit and build up their friends in the faith. As the time drew near for the court to sit, when they knew they would be tried for their lives, they went to Boston, and with them Alice Cowland, who came to bring linen wherein to wrap the dead bodies of them who were to suffer, and others who desired to accompany the sufferers to the end. Mary Dyer also returned from Rhode Island, and the three who had thus incurred the penalty of the law were brought before the general court on the 19th of October, 1659. For sedition and presumptuous obtruding themselves upon us, notwithstanding their being sentenced to banishment on pain of death. They acknowledged themselves to be Quakers, who had been banished on pain of death, and, on the next day, they were all condemned to die. When Robinson was sentenced, he offered a paper containing a statement that while he was in Rhode Island, the Lord commanded him to go to Boston and lay down his life there, that he durst not but obey, without inquiring further concerning it believing that it became him as a child to show obedience to the Lord without any unwillingness. Therefore, he remained in their jurisdiction. Stevenson asserted that he was commanded by the Lord to leave his wife and children and be a prophet to the nations. He first went to Barbados, but hearing that a law had been made in New England to put the servants of the living God to death, if they returned from banishment, as he considered the thing and pondered it in his heart. Immediately there came the word of the Lord unto him, saying, Thou knowest not, but thou mayest go thither. So afterward the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Go to Boston with the friend William Robinson. And he obeyed the command, not in his own will, but in the will of God. Sentence of death was then recorded against the prisoners, and they were remanded to jail. The record of these proceedings is as follows. William Robinson, Marmaduke Stevenson, and Mary Dyer banished this jurisdiction by the last court of assistance on pain of death, being committed by order of the general court, were sent for, brought to the bar, acknowledged themselves to be the persons banished. After a full hearing of what the prisoners could say for themselves, it was put to a question whether William Robinson Marmaduke Stevenson and Mary Dyer, the persons now in prison, who had been convicted for Quakers and banished this jurisdiction on pain of death, should be put to death according as the law provides in this case. The court resolved this question in the affirmative, and the governor in open court declared the sentence to William Robinson that was first to the bar. William Robinson, you will go from hence to the place of execution and there and then hang till you be dead. The like sentence the governor in open court pronounced against Marmaduke Stevenson and Mary Dyer, being brought to the bar, whereas William Robinson, Marmaduke Stevenson, and Mary Dyer are sentenced by this court to death for their rebellion, etc. It is ordered 
that the Secretary issue out his warrant to Edward Betchelson, Marshal General, for repairing to the prison on the 27th of this instant October, and take the said William Robinson, Marmaduke Stevenson, and Mary Dyer into his custody, and then, forthwith, by the aid of Captain James Oliver, with one hundred soldiers taken out by his order proportionately out of each company in Boston, completely armed with pike and musketeers, with powder and bullet, to lead them to the place of execution, and there see them hang till they be dead, and in their going, and being there in return, to see all things be carried peacefully and orderly. Warrants issued accordingly. It is ordered that Mr. Zachariah Sims and Mr. John Norton repair to the prison and render their endeavors to make the prisoners sensible of their approaching danger by the sentence of this court and prepare them for the approaching end. On the afternoon of October 22nd, the prisoners were led forth to execution, surrounded by a guard of armed men and several horsemen, with drums beating to prevent the multitude from hearing anything they might say. Glorious signs of heavenly joy and gladness were beheld in the countenances of these three persons, who walked hand in hand, Mary being the middlemost. Nothing could exceed the exultation with which they went forth to die, and they called on all to witness that they suffered for the cause of truth. This, said Mary Dyer, is an hour the greatest joy I ever knew. No ear can hear, no tongue can utter, and no heart can understand the sweet refreshings of the Spirit of the Lord which I now feel. The last words of Robinson were, I suffer for Christ in whom I live and for whom I die. Stevenson said, This day shall we be at rest with the Lord. Mary Dyer saw her two companions die before her eyes and ascended the ladder to meet her own fate. Everything was ready, the rope adjusted to her neck, her extremities tied and her face covered, when a faint shout was heard in the distant, which grew stronger and stronger, and was soon caught and repeated by a hundred willing hearts. A reprieve, a reprieve, was the cry, and the execution was stopped. But she, whose mind was intently fastened on another world, cried out that she desired to suffer with her brethren, unless the magistrates would repeal their wicked law. She was saved by the intercession of her son, but on the express condition that she should be carried to the place of execution and stand upon the gallows with a rope around her neck, and then carried out of the colony. She was accordingly taken home to Rhode Island, but her resolution was still unshaken, and she was again moved to return to the bloody town of Boston, where she arrived in the spring of 1660. This determination of a feeble and aged woman to brave all the terrors of their laws might well fill the magistrates with astonishment, but the pride of consistency had already involved them in acts of extreme cruelty, and they thought it impossible now to recede. The other executions were considered acts of stern necessity and caused much discontent. A hope was entertained till the last moment that the condemned would consent to depart from this jurisdiction, and when Mary Dyer was sent for by the court, after her second return, Governor Endicott said, Are you the same Mary Dyer that was here before? Giving her an opportunity to escape by a denial of the fact, there having been another of the name returned from England. But she would not make an evasion. I am the same Mary Dyer that was here the last general court. You will own yourself a Quaker, will you not? I own myself to be reproachfully called so, and you were sentenced to be hanged on the morning of the next day. This is no more than thou saidst before, was her intrepid reply, when the sentence of death was pronounced. But now, said the governor, it is to be executed. Therefore prepare yourself, for tomorrow at nine o'clock you die. I came, was the reply, in obedience to the will of God, the last general court, desiring you to repeal your unrighteous laws of banishment or pain of death. And the same is my work now, an earnest request. Although I told you if you refused to repeal them, the Lord would send others of his servants 
to witness against them. At the appointed time on the next day, Jews brought forth and, with a band of soldiers, led through the town, about a mile to the place of execution, the drums beating before and behind her the whole distance. When she was upon the gallows, it was told her that if she would return home, she might come down and save her life, to which she replied, Nay, I cannot, for in obedience to the will of the Lord I came, and in his will I abide faithful unto death. Another said that she had been there before. She had the sentence of banishment upon pain of death, and had broken the law in coming again now, and therefore she was guilty of her own blood. Nay, she answered, I came to keep blood guiltiness from you, desiring you to repeal the unrighteous and unjust law of banishment upon pain of death, made against the innocent servants of the Lord. Therefore, my blood will be required at your hands, who willfully do it. But for those who do it in the simplicity of their hearts, I desire the Lord to forgive them. I came to do the will of my Father, and in obedience to His will, I stand even to death. A minister who was present then said, Mary Dyer, repent, O oh, repent, and be not so deluded and carried away by the deceit of the devil. But she answered, Nay, man, I am not now to repent. She was then asked to have the elders pray for her, but she said, I know never an elder here. She added that she desired the prayers of all the people of God. Perhaps, said one scoffingly, she thinks there is none here. Then looking round, she said, I know but few here. Being again asked to have one of the elders pray for her, she said, Nay, first a child, then a young man, then a strong man, before an elder in Christ Jesus. She spoke of the other world and of the eternal happiness into which she was about to enter, and in this well-disposed condition was turned off and died a martyr of Christ being twice led to death, which the first time she expected with undaunted courage and now suffered with Christian fortitude. She hangs as a flag for others to take example by, said a member of the court, as the lifeless body hung suspended from the gallows. William Ledra was the next who suffered for a violation of this law. After several whippings and a tedious imprisonment, he had been banished on pain of death, but soon returned and appeared publicly in Boston. He was immediately seized and chained to a log of wood in prison, where he suffered much from the cold during the winter months. In March 1661, he was brought to trial before the Court of Assistance in Boston. His offense of being a Quaker and returning after banishment on pain of death was stated to him when he demanded what evil he had done. The reply was that he had abused authority. He had refused to take off his hat in court and would say thee and thou. Will you put me to death, he asked, for speaking good English and for not putting off my clothes? A man may speak treason in good English. Is it treason to say thee and thou to a single person? Will you return to England, demanded the governor. I have no business there, was the reply. Then you shall go that way, pointing to the gallows. Will you put me to death for breathing in the air of your jurisdiction? What have you against me? I appeal to the laws of England for my trial. If by them I am guilty, I refuse not to die. The twenty years before it had been accounted perjury and treason to speak of appeals to the king, and a sneering remark was made on the present occasion, which was long remembered by Charles the Second, whose royal ear it soon reached. This year you appealed to England, the next Parliament was sent over to inquire, and the third year the government of England will be changed. At that moment, Winlock Christensen, another banished Quaker, suddenly and most unexpectedly entered the court and took his stand by the side of the prisoner, striking dismay into the minds of all the magistrates and for a time interrupting the proceedings of the court. Are you not the Winlock Christison who was banished on pain of death, demanded the governor? Yea, I am. What dost thou hear then? 
I am come here, was the answer, to warn you that you should shed no more innocent blood. The blood that you have shed already cries to the Lord God for vengeance to come upon you. He was immediately committed to prison, and Ledra was offered his life if he would promise to depart and return no more. Refusing this, sentence of death was passed upon him to take effect on the 14th of March. On the day previous to his execution, he wrote a long farewell letter to his friends in which he said, The sweet influences of the morning star, like a flood distilling into my innocent habitation, has so filled me with the joy of the Lord and the beauty of holiness, that my spirit is as if it did not inhabit a tabernacle of clay, but is wholly swallowed up in the bosom of eternity, from whence it had long its being. After a morning lecture on the 14th of March, the governor and a guard of soldiers came to the prison, where the prisoners' irons were removed, and he took leave of his fellow prisoners. Arrived at the gallows, a stranger among the crowd, who had just come by sea, was deeply affected, and endeavored to interrupt the proceedings. For God's sakes, he cried, addressing the multitude in a loud voice, take not away the man's life, but remember Gamaliel's counsel to the Jews. If this be of man, it will come to naught, but if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it. But be careful ye, be not found fighters of God. The captain of the guard bade him hold his peace, and he departed with tears, telling them they had no warrant from the word of God, no power from the king to hang the man. When the executioner was adjusting the rope to Ledra's neck, he was heard to say, I commit my righteous cause unto thee, O God. The last words he uttered were, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. The crowd at length dispersed, but a few friends of the deceased remained, caught the body in their arms when it was cut down, and after the executioner had stripped it of clothing, they were permitted to pay the last tribute of affection to the remains of the dead friend. When Winlock Christensen was brought to trial, he addressed the court with undaunted courage. By what law will you put me to death? We have a law, and by that law you are to die. Who authorized you to make that law? We have a patent which gives us the power. Have you authority to make laws repugnant to the laws of England? No. Then you were gone beyond your bounds. If the king did, but know your hearts as God knows them, he would see that they are as rotten towards him as they are towards God. You and I are subjects of the king, and I demand to be tried by the laws of my own nation. There is no law in England to hang Quakers. But there is a law in England to hang Jesuits. If you put me to death, it is not because I go under the name of a Jesuit, but of a Quaker. I appeal to my own nation. You have broken our law, was the reply, and we shall try you. The jury immediately returned a verdict of guilty, but the magistrates were divided in pronouncing sentence. The governor was irritated at their wavering, and on the second vote there appeared a majority for the doom of death. What do you gain by it, said the prisoner. Do not think to weary out the living God by taking away the lives of his servants. For the last man that you have put to death, here are five come in his room. If ye have power to take my life, God can raise up the same principles of life in ten of his servants, and send them among you in my room, that you may have torment upon torment, which is your portion. For there is no peace to the wicked, saith my God. He was then remanded to prison, and at the next general court in June 1661, his case again came up. The following record exhibits the result. The court, having considered what Wentlock Christofferson could say for himself, footnote, the records call him by this name, but he called and signed himself Christison. End of footnote. In reference to appeal from the judgment and sentence of the Court of Assistance in March last, being brought to the bar, judge me to order that the governor pronounce sentence of death against him in open court, and to declare that the time of his execution shall be on the thirtieth day of this month of June, presently after the lecture, 
by warrant from the governor, provided, nevertheless, that if the said Christofferson, any time before his execution, shall desire the court's favor, and, by a writing under his hand, engage that he will forthwith depart this jurisdiction, and from thenceforth return no more into it, without first having obtained leave from the general court or council. He shall thereupon be discharged. The covenant in open court, the prisoner being at the bar, pronounced sentence of death against him, and acquainted him of the court's favor. The prisoner accepted the clemency of the court upon these terms, and was discharged. End of section 78《Section 79 of American State Trials, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Doc D. L. Martin. American State Trials, Volume 1 by John D. Lawson. The Trial of Patrick Blake for the murder of his wife, New York, 1816. The narrative. In a squalid tenement house in New York City, a woman is murdered at night while she slept. The deed is done with a sharp knife which pierces her heart, and she dies instantly without being able to utter a cry. The husband was in the same bed, and near them in another bed slept two other women. The husband was charged with the murder. On the trial, the evidence was no stronger that he was the assassin than that it was one of the two women, and the judge felt compelled to tell the jury that it would be wrong to convict the prisoner on the evidence before them. She must have been murdered by one of the three, but which one? The mystery was never unraveled. Well might the old reporter of this case conclude his recital in these words. Where? Reader in this dark affair, is there not something still behind the curtain? The trial in the court of Oyer and Terminer, City Hall, New York, July 1816. Note 1. Honorable Jonas Platt. Note 2. Judge. Honorable Jacob Radcliffe. Note 3. Mayor. George Buckmaster. Peter Conroy. Alderman. Note 1, New York City Hall Reporter, Ante, page 61. Note 2, Platt, Jonas, 1769 to 1834, born Poughkeepsie, New York, member Assembly, 1796, Congressman, 1799, defeated for Governor of New York, 1810, Justice Supreme Court, 1814 to 1823. Note 3. See Mazzara's case, ante, page 60. June 27. The prisoner, Patrick Blake, having been previously indicted for the murder on April 22, 1816, of his wife, Margaret Blake, by stabbing her in the left breast with a knife, was arraigned and pleaded not guilty. Having no counsel, the court assigned him for his defense, David B. Ogden. Note 4, and Mr. Sampson, Note 5, and set the trial for July 2nd, John Rodman, District Attorney for the State. July 2nd, Mr. Rodman for the People opened the case by explaining to the jury the nature of circumstantial evidence and argued that where a man is in a situation to commit a particular crime and it appears that no one else could have committed it, the proof of his guilt is presumed unless the contrary is proved. The prisoner and his wife had frequently quarreled. This showed a motive. Note 4. See Mazzara's case, ante, page 60. Note 5. See Mazzara's case, ante, page 60. Witnesses for the Prosecution John Bedient. I am coroner of this city. 
On the morning of the 23rd day of April last, prisoner with another came to my house, and prisoner said that he went to bed between 9 and 10 o'clock of the preceding evening in the same bed with his wife, and that he woke at about 4 in the morning and found her dead. Inquired whether she died in a fit. He said he knew nothing about it and wished me to go and view the body. I proceeded with the prisoner and his companion immediately to a cellar kitchen in Anthony Street, in which there were three places for sleeping, one of which was represented as the place where the prisoner and his wife slept, and this was on a bedstead. The other places were, where it was said two women slept, in bunks or miserable beds, the nearest of which I should judge to be within three or four yards of the bed where the prisoner slept. One of these bunks was in full view of the prisoner's bed. I turned up the clothes from the body and found a wound under the right breast. My impression is that it was her right breast, but am not certain. There was much blood in the bed and on her clothes. The body was lying on the left side. The prisoner appeared totally indifferent and insensible. Sent for surgeons to examine the wound. Discovered the scar of a wound near the same place where the recent wound appeared and asked the prisoner how the wound was made. He said it was made by falling on a knife she held in her hand. After the examination of the deceased, I asked the coroner's jury whether they wished to examine the prisoner. At their request, the prisoner took off his coat, and I discovered blood on the shirt sleeve of his right arm between the wrist and elbow. There also appeared to be blood under the roots of his fingernails. I asked him how that blood came there. He said he did not know and appeared to be ignorant was stupid or insensible. About this time, Abner Curtis, a police officer, brought a jackknife four or five inches long in the blade on which there was blood. Prisoner was asked whether that was the knife, to which he answered it was. He was asked whether he knew how the blood came on the knife, answered that he did not. Rodman, producing a jackknife about three or four inches in the blade, the point of which was sharp, the blade straight and thick in the back. Is this the knife, the very same, though I was somewhat mistaken in the link? Dr. Thomas Cock, am a surgeon, on the morning of April 23rd, was called by the coroner to examine the wound inflicted on the body of Margaret Blake. This wound was under the left pap between the fifth and sixth rib. A short time after I came, Dr. Stevens came in with instruments adapted for such an examination. An incision was made by him, and I saw the result of the examination. The weapon with which the wound was inflicted apparently progressed between the cartilages of the fifth and sixth ribs in the direction of the heart. The wound appeared to have been done with a knife or other sharp-pointed instrument. Dr. Stevens put his finger in the wound and said that it went in the direction of the heart. I saw an old scar near the new wound. Rodman, I wish the court to note that part of the testimony. Sampson, we do not see what this has to do with the case. We wish the public prosecutor to explain his views in relation to this part of the evidence. Rodman, I stated in the opening that I intended to show there were frequent quarrels between the prisoner and the deceased to establish this general malevolence towards her, and I propose to show in the progress of this trial that on a former occasion the prisoner stabbed the deceased with a deadly weapon and inflicted a wound, which then failed in its object, but occasioned this scar. I contend this will be proper evidence to show the evil intent which actuated his mind. The court. This, as an insulated fact, remote in point of time from the transaction forming the charge the prisoner is now called on to answer, is inadmissible. So a former quarrel, unconnected with the transaction wherein the death ensued, cannot be given in evidence. But if you can fill up the chasm of time between that wherein the first and second wound was inflicted, showing that the latter flowed from the former occasion, 
or was connected therewith, or if you can show there were frequent quarrels between the prisoner and the deceased taking place but a short time preceding her death, you are at liberty to produce such evidence. But we think, without such restriction, the introduction of such evidence would be extremely dangerous. Dr. Richard S. Walker, I was called on to visit the deceased in company with Dr. Stevens and others. Dr. Stevens examined the wound, which was on the left side, directly under the angle of the breast. He tried to introduce a small probe and found it difficult. The cartilaginous part of the ribs appeared to have been penetrated transversely by some sharp-pointed instrument which entered the sac or membrane of the heart. This, in technical language, is called the pericardium. It covers the heart, enclosing it to its basis, and its use is to keep the heart in its place without interrupting its office and to prevent its friction with the other parts. Rodman do you think that knife could have inflicted the wound you examined on the deceased? I particularly examined the separation of the ribs, and from the appearance of that separation, I am inclined to think that the wound could not have been inflicted with this knife. It appeared to have been pierced very clean. In that part, the rib is of a soft, spongy, cartilaginous substance. A small probe could not be introduced and it appears to me that it could have been introduced through an incision made with this knife. The court, after the instrument, whatever it might be, was withdrawn, would not the cartilaginous parts through which the instrument passed have naturally collapsed? It is probable that the cartilaginous part of the ribs might have collapsed from the contraction of the muscles. I did not examine the wound with a view of ascertaining whether it could have been inflicted with this instrument. If it was, I should think it must have been a violent thrust. Dr. Alexander H. Stevens, am a surgeon and have been in the habit of dissecting subjects in Europe. At the time mentioned, I went to examine the body of deceased, which was drawn up for that purpose. Some considerable blood was on her left side, some on her linen, and some on her hair. The wound was in the place described by the other witnesses. Serum ran therefrom. I endeavored to introduce a blunt instrument to ascertain the direction of the wound and found that it went towards the heart. I found a difficulty of penetrating the chest with a director and, of course, made a dissection by which I first ascertained that the instrument with which the wound was inflicted had passed through and entirely divided the rib, which, in that place, was about two-thirds of an inch in breadth. One part of the rib through which the instrument passed was fractured. After a way was cleared, I introduced my finger into the chest and found much coagulated blood in the cavity. I satisfactorily ascertained and believed that the instrument entered the left ventricle of the heart. I believe that such a wound might have been inflicted with this knife. James Hopson, am a police magistrate. On April 23rd, the turnkey of Bridewell, in my presence, took out of the prisoner's waistcoat pocket this knife, which he said was his. The knife, at that time, had some appearance of blood, but looked nearly as it does now. Blood was on his shirt and appeared at the roots of his nails. Dr. John K. Rogers was present at the examination of the deceased with Dr. Stevens. My opinion is that the wound inflicted could have been made with this knife, and I fully coincide with the doctor in every particular of his testimony. Catherine McGee On April 23rd, I lived in the same apartment with prisoner and his wife, had lived there about five weeks, Jane McFall also lived with us, and we had several places for sleeping. Prisoner and his wife slept on a bedstead in full view of the place where I slept. On that day, I had been away and returned at about five o'clock in the afternoon and found the deceased in bed. Mrs. McFall was in the room. 
About eight or nine o'clock in the evening, the prisoner, who was a laborer, returned from his work and deceased, was still in bed. He went to the bed and said something to her, and she answered, But what? I cannot say. I had spoken to deceased in the afternoon and asked her to get up, to which she answered, Let me alone, and I thought she was drunk. After the prisoner returned, I went to getting supper, and when it was ready, we pulled the table near the bed whereon deceased lay. Prisoner sat on the foreside of the bed with us and finished supper, which consisted of potatoes and fish. About an hour after, we all went to bed, but before going to bed, went to the bedside where deceased lay to bind a handkerchief round her head, because I thought her drunk, and this would do her good discovered some blood on the back of her hand, which might have proceeded from a scratch. And the prisoner, who was then sitting upon the foot of the bed, angrily told me to let his wife alone, and when I inquired of him how the blood came there, said it was none of my business. Did not then think much of the blood, but thought of it the next morning, and mentioned the circumstance to Mrs. McFall before we went to bed did not hear any noise or disturbance through the night. But very early in the morning, about four o'clock, I was awake, and the prisoner said to me, Are you asleep? I answered, No. The prisoner then said, I am afraid Peggy is dead. She will not speak to me. Says I, That cannot be, for she was well enough in the afternoon and evening before. Wake her, says I. Perhaps she is asleep. Prisoner then said she was dead and stiff. He struck up a light, and from my bed I saw him shake her and discovered that she was actually dead. He said, I am a poor man this morning. I told him to go for the neighbors. He went out and did not return till several hours afterwards with the coroner. Do not know that the prisoner lived more unhappily with his wife than is common. Never had any difference with the deceased. Jane McFall, am a poor woman, have lost my right arm, and work in the house of industry. Slept in the same room with the prisoner and his wife. In the morning I heard him cry out three times, Peggy. I had lived in the same house about eleven weeks. I never knew of any difficulty between the prisoner and the deceased. Catherine McGee did not, the evening before the death of Mrs. Blake, mention to me about the blood on her hand did not hear any conversation between the prisoner and his wife that evening. Mrs. McGee and deceased were as intimate as sisters. John Bedient recalled, examined the clothes and bed to try to find the instrument which occasioned the wound. I found none. Am now convinced that the wound was on the left breast of the deceased. Dr. Stevens and Walker recalled, such a wound would be apt to produce almost instantaneous death. The person might have groaned, but how sleep or drunkenness would have prevented this, we cannot determine. Dr. Benjamin R. Robson, my opinion is founded on actual observation that a wound in that part of the body would have occasioned instantaneous death without a groan. Note 7. It must have been a violent thrust and if it went through the rib, it must have been fractured. Dr. Matthew Cunningham saw the wound and believe it could have been inflicted with this knife and that it would have caused instant death, thought the cartilages of the ribs were divided, examined the bed to find the instrument, but found none. Nicholas C. Everett was foreman of the coroner's inquest that sat on the body prisoner was indifferent, said he knew nothing about the murder and gave no satisfaction whatsoever, have understood by common report that the prisoner and the deceased lived unhappily together. No person on the jury thought that Mrs. McGee discovered fear. No suspicion fell on her, have known her for a considerable time and have heard nothing against her character saw blood on the shirt and arms of the prisoner, and searched the bed and could find no instrument which could have caused the murder. Catherine Hanley, am a near neighbor to the prisoner. At four o'clock in the morning, prisoner called out to my husband to let him in, 
and when I opened the door, he said, Peggy is dead. I went with him to his apartment, and he went with me to the bedside. Prisoner said he had no hand in her death and knew nothing about it. He stayed in the room after I came there about an hour and then went for his son, and when his son came, the prisoner went for the coroner. Mrs. McGee is a married woman whose husband was then in the country but is now in this city. She said that she knew nothing about the death and that the night before she saw blood on the hand of the deceased. William O'Connor lived in the same house with the prisoner, was waked very early that morning, and when I came into the room I saw three women, one of which, Mrs. Hanley, was dressed. The other two, Mrs. McGee and Mrs. McFall, were not. In a short time after I came, the prisoner and his son entered the room. I told the prisoner it was a terrible thing to happen in the course of the night in the same bed with him. He denied any knowledge of the manner in which she came to her death and said he had no hand in it. Note 7. The reason on which this opinion is founded was not shown on the trial. It is well known that the office of the left ventricle of the heart is to propel the blood through the whole body, that of the right to propel it through the lungs only. The left ventricle is much the thickest and strongest. The action of the left ventricle in thus forcing the blood through the human system in its dilation may be likened to that of a forcing pump, and it is obvious that when the propelling power is destroyed in either, all action must suddenly cease. Besides, it should be considered that from the left ventricle the great artery or canal arises which deals out its branches to every part of the body. From the curved part of this artery, a little above the heart, arises the carotid artery, which runs directly on both sides of the larynx to the brain in diverse ramifications. Hence a wound in this ventricle must necessarily produce certain death. Reporter. Rodman then read the prisoner's examination taken at the police. This examination did not, in any particular, contradict any account of this transaction the prisoner had before given. It was, when taken together, an enlargement of the circumstances of a case, then already involved in great doubt and mystery. It served at any rate, if creditable, to bring the murder home to one of the three persons who slept in the room with the deceased during the night of the 22nd of April after they had retired to rest. These facts were distinctly stated. 1. The prisoner, when supper was ready, went to the bedside and asked his wife to partake, which she declined. 2. The prisoner fell asleep while his wife and the two women were conversing about the old countries. This conversation is again recognized distinctly in the examination. 3. When he arose in the morning, he found the door bolted. 4. The blood on his arm was occasioned by laying it over the deceased in the morning when he discovered she was dead. Neither of the women, however, remembered this conversation between themselves and the deceased. Witnesses for the Prisoner Nehemiah Allen was the keeper of the bridewell and searched the prisoner when brought there. I took out of his pocket this knife. Do not think it was materially different from what it is now. Dr. Cunningham recalled, When I saw this knife, there was every appearance of clotted blood on the back of the blade. I repeat that it is my opinion that a wound made in that part of the heart would occasion instantaneous death. Dr. Stevens recalled, Am confident that the wound inflicted on the deceased penetrated the left ventricle of the heart. Mr. Ogden this case is involved in much doubt and mystery. There are strong presumptions against the prisoner, stronger in his favor. The benignity of the law requires the jury to give more weight to the former than the latter. That the deceased was murdered is admitted. The only question is, did the prisoner murder her? The public prosecutor must rely on the strength of his own case. He cannot call on us to disprove that which it is first incumbent on him to establish. 
the inquiry in this case is not who could have committed this murder if the prisoner did not. The account the prisoner has given of this transaction from the commencement has been plain, consistent, and uniform. It has substantially corresponded with the other testimony adduced on behalf of the prosecution. Flight, concealment, and fear, the inseparable concomitants of guilt, are expressly negatived by all the testimony. No motive to commit this horrid crime existed. The proof of domestic difficulties between the prisoner and the deceased failed on behalf of the prosecution. The testimony of McGee is, to say the least, strange and equivocal. It stands contradicted in various particulars. The doctors disagree. All is doubt and uncertainty. But if he did not commit this murder, who did? We cannot. We are not bound to show. It is difficult to penetrate into the mysteries of the case, and wise and discreet jurors will pause and hesitate long before they will render a verdict against the prisoner because he cannot explain a transaction which the public prosecutor has not done. Mr. Rodman, I shall recur to the facts in the case and contend that they are inconsistent with the innocence of the prisoner. If the jurors, after a mature consideration of all the circumstances, believe this, they will find him guilty. From all the facts in the case, the conclusion is irresistible that one of the three persons who stayed in the apartment that night committed this murder. It is clearly established that she must have been murdered after the others had retired to rest and in the dead of night. The door was bolted. Neither Catherine McGee nor Jane Mufall, had they been disposed, would have undertaken this horrid deed in his presence for fear of certain detection. The latter woman had not the power, and neither of them had the least motive. McGee and the deceased were as intimate as sisters. It is preposterous and absurd to suppose that either of these women committed the crime. If they did not, he did. He has not produced a single circumstance either in favor of his character or in explanation of the dark transaction. I have shown him in a situation in which he might have committed the crime and none else could have committed it. I leave it to the jurors. Mr. Justice Platt, gentlemen of the jury, the prisoner at the bar is charged with the crime of murder committed on Margaret Blake, his wife that a horrid murder under the most aggravating circumstances was committed on this woman is certain. The great difficulty in the case consists in correctly determining this important question, whether Patrick Blake did commit this murder. The law on the subject is well settled. Murder is defined as the killing of a person in the peace of the people, with malice aforethought, either express or implied in law. Whether such murder was committed by the prisoner depends on a careful examination of all the facts and circumstances of this case from which the jury is to deduce the conclusion of his guilt or innocence. It has been justly remarked by the counsel on behalf of the prosecution that as this crime is generally perpetrated in secret where there are no eyewitnesses of the fact that circumstantial evidence must be resorted to and in various circumstances is sufficient. On this occasion, I shall not go minutely into the evidence. It has been particularly stated and ably commented on by the counsel on both sides and must be fresh in your recollection. I shall merely advert to the prominent points in the case and leave it to your determination with such remarks as the court considers its nature requires. The story of this transaction is short and simple. It appears that the prisoner and his wife lived in an obscure situation in Anthony Street in this city. There were two women, Catherine McGee and Jane McFall, living as inmates in his apartment. On the afternoon of the 23rd day of April last, 
the deceased was in bed and the two women were in the room and she was supposed to have been in a state of intoxication. Between eight and nine o'clock in the evening of the same day, the prisoner returned home from his labor and the deceased was still in bed. While one of the women was preparing supper, the prisoner was near the bed for a considerable time and spoke to his wife, and she answered him, but not distinctly enough to be heard by the witness McGee. After supper was prepared, the table was drawn near the bed, and the prisoner, sitting on the bed, ate his supper with the two women. Between nine and ten o'clock, Mrs. McGee, if she is entitled to belief, undertook to bind a handkerchief round the head of the deceased, and in doing this she saw blood on the back of the hand. She inquired of the prisoner how it came there, who angrily told her it was none of her business, and required her to let the deceased alone. They retired to rest, and about four o'clock in the morning the prisoner called out to the deceased and gave the alarm to the women. A light was procured by the prisoner, and after examining and ascertaining that his wife was dead, the prisoner said that he was a poor man that morning. He called in a neighboring woman, stayed about an hour, went for his son and brought him, and then went immediately for the coroner. There is nothing unnatural in this conduct, nor does it indicate guilt. It clearly appears that he returned to the house and continued there about an hour before he went for the coroner, and in this part of her testimony, Mrs. McGee is certainly mistaken. On this point, she stands contradicted, and how far it detracts from her credibility in other particulars is left for you to determine. The two women agree in many particulars in their testimony, but they disagree on the subject of the wife's speaking to the prisoner the evening preceding her death. The conduct of Mrs. McGee in not rising in the morning immediately on hearing of the death has been criticized with much severity by the prisoner's counsel, but it should be recollected that fear operates differently on different minds and therefore it appears to me that this circumstance is rather of an equivocal nature. The fair construction of the whole testimony adduced on the subject of domestic difficulties is that they lived as peaceable together as is common with people in that condition, and I think we may say with confidence that the ground assumed by the counsel for the prosecution in the opening intended to be founded on family discord has totally failed. In his examination, the prisoner has been consistent. He has uniformly given the same account of this transaction. The usual concomitants of guilt are flight, alarm, concealment. It must be conceded that these indications of guilt cannot be imputed to the prisoner. He never denied the knife was his. He made no effort to conceal it. He did not endeavor to escape. There are several suppositions which may be framed concerning this murder. 1. She might have murdered herself. 2. She might have been murdered by some person before the prisoner returned in the evening. 3. She might have been murdered after his return and during the night and this last supposition is strongly fortified by the various circumstances in the case. If she was not murdered before the return of the prisoner, then the conclusion is irresistible that she was murdered by one of the three persons who stayed in that apartment during the night unless she committed suicide. All the facts and circumstances in the case forbid the conclusion either that she was murdered by any person before the return of the prisoner in the evening or that she murdered herself either before or after his return. The prisoner himself, in his examination, shows that the deceased spoke and conversed after his return, and no instrument was found near the body by which she inflicted the wound. It therefore follows that she was murdered by one of the three persons who stayed in that room during the night, by which of them it is impossible to say. 
Is it improbable that some other person in that room besides the prisoner rose in the silence of the night, took the knife from his pocket, inflicted the wound, and returned the weapon to its place to cast the odium of such a horrid deed on the prisoner? What person this was, it requires us not to say, nor is it necessary to inquire. Upon the whole, gentlemen, notwithstanding every effort to fathom this mysterious transaction and arrive at the truth, we find ourselves embarrassed with difficulties, and a painful doubt rests on the mind. It only remains for me to charge you that so dark is the whole transaction before us, and so involved in uncertainty is this case, that it would be utterly unsafe on this testimony to convict the prisoner. And when I say this, I wish it to be distinctly understood that I express the unanimous opinion of the court. The jurors retired and in about five minutes returned with a verdict of not guilty. End of section 79 End of American State Trials, Volume 1 by John D. Lawson